Okay. So hello everybody, welcome. I'm sorry for the late start. Um, I think I got all your project reports. Um, so today, uh, you know, as usual, um, ask two questions, homework project, and then we'll talk about sound. So we are basically now in the second half and the first half was all about this memory equivalent capacity generalization measurement. And now um, the second half is more about your project, but also about how to actually deal with multimedia data, right? Because obviously uh, it's experimental design for multimedia. So in multimedia, by the way, is the hardest, um, especially videos are pretty hard. Um, so I, I always feel like if you can do it for multimedia, then everything else is much simpler. Um, obviously other specialists you know, like if they do NLP or, or, or if they just do, you know, financial data, they will uh, contradict me and say that's not right. Um, but for me, the argument is that multimedia data is inherently data for, uh, from sensors. And that means we basically have a direct, um, we have a direct view of the universe in some ways. So we basically have a footprint of the universe in our sensor and we have to deal with nature like, directly, um, there's no human intervention. And of course, human intervention could be bad, right? Some financial data, who knows what humans do, right? There's a whole component that's different and so on and so forth. But um, well, again, what I like about multimedia data is that it's basically um, physical data. So um, answers to questions, um, always, always there. Um, we're gonna talk about the homework. We have the solution, I posted it yesterday night. Um, but I want to start with projects. So I think I responded to everybody through their projects. Um, sometimes I just said, hey, this sounds good. And then I just expect you to you know, go ahead and, and do your thing. And sometimes I'd give you some questions back and, and said, hey, um, so by the way, none of the projects went any way, shape or form out of, uh, out of the scope. Uh, most of the time, I probably just send you a question back and said, hey, can you little, make a little clear of how you use measurements here? And that's basically, um, uh, mostly that. Um, um, there were, were like one or two projects that were trying to extend the theory, uh, for example, from classification to regression. Um, that's, I'm was gonna say, not completely trivial. Um, so uh, this is Berkeley, so I let you do and go with it. But I'm just saying that it may be good to discuss in office hours um, um, to, to sort of figure out, you know, if, if you have concrete ideas and how I can support you in those ideas. Obviously, I'm interested in doing that, uh, and also in you doing that and in learning how you guys do that. But uh, I don't want you to fail, right? I don't want you to like just sit at the end of the semester and say I have no idea how to do this. And so it's good for sort of these more theoretical projects to actually come to office hours and let's discuss it out to make sure we have a plan there and something that is satisfiable. Okay, so. Um, Let's talk about the homework, um, which is um, here, pages. Okay, so that would be homework four, right? Okay, yes. Um, I actually have to stop sharing this. And then there's a chat question. Just tell us the class to go over the project proposal. Um, I cannot do after class, but we, we can find a time. And also um, in the worst case, the time is in the office hours, okay? Um, it's unfortunate I don't have time after class um, right now. Um, in general, I do. So this is, um, let me share the homework screen. Um, here we go. So this is the homework. So, um, and this homework was mostly sort of a recap of the memory equivalent capacity uh, calculations and the memory equivalent capacity calculations were basically, um, you know, just apply the rules. Okay, so in this case, we have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, that gives you um, uh, three inputs and, and one bias, so that's four. Four times three is 12. And then the next one also has 12, except we only have three bits out. So the minimum of 3, 12 is then obviously 3. So 12 plus 3 is 15. And then we do the same again because we have 1, 2, 3, 4 here. But in reality, we only have 3 inputs. So that will be 12 plus 3 plus 3 is 18. By the way, um, this calculation is correct. 
um, there was people uh, on Piazza saying that TF Meter may have a bug, and that is actually, I think, correct. I'm gonna um, talk to um, uh, I'm gonna talk to uh, uh, Henrik and Axel. They were both doing the 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 uh, um, how do you call it the the, the meter app the um, TF meter app. And by doing so, they actually, um, they actually um, wanted to, uh, you know, not make this correct. But it turns out, I think they may, they may have introduced a bug counting the last neuron not correctly. So you're gonna see what happens there. Um, and I'm gonna talk to them um, because I think uh, whoever posted on Piazza was correct. Okay, so three plus four plus four is one, two, three, four, right? So you have uh, three here, one, two, three as input. And then um, the next one has one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And since they are actually directly connected to the input, um, there's no reason to, to, they're not dependent layers, right? They're dependent on the input. So there's this sort of a super deep network, super deep, deep. And that becomes 11 bits, you're just adding those. Um, but uh, what's interesting here, of course, you gotta be careful, like say, for example, um, this x1 and x2 was a Boolean function, right? Then you, we already know that there's only, you know, um, four bits maximally of, of outcomes, and then it would actually be ending up just four, okay? But, um, in this case, we, ha we ha don't have any restrictions given for the input, so we assume maximum uh, possible, and that will be 11. So then what is the maximum amount of rows that each network in A and B can memorize, okay? So obviously, we can memorize, we can guarantee to memorize 18 rows of any binary classification, and we can memorize uh, 11 rows um, of two inputs, right? So that is basically, what this memory equivalent capacity gives us. Um, and what is what now the interesting question is, what happens if you were doing this for four classes instead of binary classification, right? Um, and then obviously what you have to do, um, you just have to make this proportional, right? So it would be nine rows of four class or five rows of uh, uh, four class in the second one. Um, because ultimately, you know, each of them, you, you can make binary again um, by, by calling them binary numbers, and then you get two tables, right? So instead of doing zero, one, zero, one, it would be zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, and then you just make this two tables, um, and then you have the answer, right? So it would be two tables of, of, uh, of that. So now, uh, draw two different neural network architectures that can guarantee to memorize the training data of 12 instance binary classification of 40 million inputs. And obviously, that's where you use the TF meter app for. And yes, that's probably how you guys found the bug. And that's pretty good. But yes, you need four inputs in a capacity of 12. Um, and you can use anything, it can be arbitrarily complicated, you know, in the spirit of the current state of the art. But reality is, we want to just measure and then we know. Um, now, convert the following neural network into a decision tree in a finite state of automaton. So, um, a finite state automaton, um, so a, the easiest way to do this, by the way, is to remember that this network was the equality for two, uh, for two Boolean inputs. And if you know that's the equality, then all you need to do is create the truth table. And then from the truth table, you can create both the decision tree as well as the finite state automaton, okay? Now, this is often the problem that when you have a model, you can't really introspect it so easily. You would actually have to go and try out all inputs and all outputs. That's why I reused the model that we had in lecture so you could actually do that. It's not trivial to take a neural network and find out what function it actually implements getting a truth table out of there. That is literally an end pre complete problem. Okay, that's the same as satisfiability. Okay. Um, so, having a model, knowing what the observations will be, very difficult. 
right? So the good news is in this case, I gave you a model that you've already seen. So knowing that this is implementing the Boolean inequality, all you need to do is the truth table and then you can get some decision tree and find a state of the model. Um, and the test this network could play an important role later. Well, we've already seen it. We used it for the Zell examples where we added a, a third variable X3 that would just confuse the net, the hack of this network, right? So two, four, six, eight. And here's what's interesting. We use this all the time as an example of like um, how to infer stuff, but can we actually? So train a neural network of your choice, like TensorFlow cares, whatever, to distinguish out from even numbers. So first of all, theoretically, all we need is one neuron. We, all we need is erase everything but the last bit, okay? So that's how you do it. Now, I created a neural network that did that. What I said is like, okay, we use features, or in other words, we convert your, our input number 2468 into binary. And now all I have to do is set the threshold at zero, right? So, <laughs> so basically, when, this, when it's, it's greater zero, then it's an odd number. And when it's uh, equal zero, then it's an even number, right? Because that, based on binary, that's all you gotta do. Um, um, but maybe you try something else and then things are a little harder than they than they're, they could be. Yeah. So discuss the limitations of the implementation. So we need a binary converter up front. Um, so maximum number is limited. Um, and that's basically the point. So if you do it with non-binary numbers, it could be harder, but also the biggest problem is that your input has limitations, right? So um, even if you do it with binary, then you have like eight as a maximum input or, or eight bits or something or 16 bits or whatever you choose for your input layer will be the maximum input. So despite the fact that our plus two rule is so nice in general, neural networks actually Suck at it. Um, yeah. Um, and then we have uh, exercise 40.8 in the case book, which is basically saying, hey, think about um, if, the, if the brain has, you know, so and so many neurons, I think 4 billion or something. If the brain had 4 billion neurons um, or 4 billion connections, right? That's 4 billion bits, um, 4 gigabit basically. Think about how much just visual information you could store in that brain, right? And the problem is, of course, you have a four gigabit of information. It's not a lot. Like a DVD is already uh, four gigabytes. That means uh, 16 gigabits. That means one DVD already wouldn't fit in your brain. It would already take four brains, right? So the conclusion is that we need to forget. There's no other way than not remembering anything but the essentials. So the brain would have would overflow after only several hours of memorizing. Um, and the best strategy is to forget irrelevant information and keep relevant information. And that's called abstraction, obviously. And also that's exactly what we do all the time is the relevant compression in your brain, right? Um, and that's what McKay was basically hinting, at least according to my interpretation, because um, we're doing his exercise so I'm not too sure. Uh, sometimes, you know, he may have other thoughts in mind, but that is my solution to that. Any questions? Okay, yeah, I rushed through this a little bit because we lost a little bit of time because of the login snafu. Um, but uh, let's, uh, let's stop sharing this. And then we screen share. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Where is my lecture here? Here we go. We screen share this. Okay. So we had um, homework projects, and now let's talk about sound. Okay. So, first of all, before we go there, Here's what's interesting. If you look at the current field of computer science, it looks like this, right? If you're doing machine learning or AI, it's mostly 
computer vision is a big chunk. There's a lot of NLP, it's a big chunk. And then actually, if you go into, if you go into, I mean, there's other structured data like financial data or, or scientific data, right? But in multimedia computing, so where it's all based on you know, pure sensor data, um, you end up having computer vision, natural language processing. And then for some reason, you have speech processing, computer auditory scene analysis is a super small field and music processing is big too, right? So we have an Emory will, uh, we, we just have, uh, you know, the Sony Grace Note are there. We have a bunch of people who, who, who really work on music processing, but it's also not very represented in, in, in this university. But the, the major point is that there's a lot of speech processing, there's a lot of music processing, you know, there's a lot of natural language processing, computer vision, but two things are not worked on really well, which is what I call computer listening, where it's like, look, computer vision doesn't do the same that we do like in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in the speech and music processing, because if, if that was the case, computer vision would basically consist of OCR. And I know there's a question. Let me answer this. Where's the question? Question. What is CASA? Oh, CASA is computer auditory scene analysis. The idea is to find out what's in, basically it's computer vision. Um, the idea is to find out what's in an auditory scene, okay? Just based on reverberation echoes and so on. And so, yeah, it's like computer vision in the sense that that um, you want to know what's in the picture. So in CASA, you want to know what the sound bounces off and sort of like a blind person being able to, to navigate. So we have computer listening. Um, we, have, uh, we, have, uh, we have music processing, we have speech processing, we have CASA, um, and we have uh, multimedia computing. Um, so in general, um, we have these kind of things. Um, and multimedia computing is obviously trying to combine them, um, but also that's a field that deserves more attention, I think. So in general, what we don't have is computer listening. We don't see the audio field, just like the computer vision field, as something where we say, hey, computer vision tries to understand what's in the picture, full stop. Not just OCR or, or you, know, uh, you know, specific uh, other object recognition techniques. So we don't have that. And it would be actually a great idea to establish that. And it's not so clear why, but I think with deep learning, we start to have a chance because with deep learning, we're not anymore sort of in the, in the details of speech and CASA and, and, and music. We, we, we just train it up and, and we go there. So the next lectures, and the, the next two actually, so this lecture and the next one coming, we'll talk about this field. Like we talk about what we did in speech and music processing, a little bit what I did in, in the more generic field of trying to actually establish computer listening. Um, but also it will help you understand sort of how audio people think, which I think there's a lot of people that really understand how computer vision people think. It's all pixels basically. But audio people have to think it's slightly different because, because audio is a slightly more difficult medium to deal with. But in general, that's where we are. So now, introduction to sound. Um, it starts with physics, really. What is sound? Um, how is it recorded and stored? What are the most important properties to us um, as somebody who, you know, needs to put that into some kind of machine learning algorithm? And, and how can we measure those properties, for example, to, re to relate them to memory equivalent capacity, right? Um, and then I'm going to do some introduction to features. And then probably uh, introduction to features too, and some frameworks to do to work with um, will also be here. So you can actually practically work with sound and, and, and you know extract the features and so on. So the first thing I want to do, and hopefully it works to Zoom, is we have this video from my heart. Um, give me a sec. That I want to try to convey over Zoom. Let's see how this works. Um, so, um, the video is here. Let's see what we can do with this uh, share screen. And you tell me if you can, if you, if you see all of this, okay.
um, Professor, I cannot hear the sound in the video, and I think um, a lot of other people are also having the same problem. Yeah, okay, I was hoping I get that feedback. Thank you. Um, so we cannot hear the sound. Uh, how do we do that? Um, you know what? I think we just keep this. Uh, this is the problem with videos. Actually, um, I think it's because um, because you're using your earphone, so then the sound is going to your earphone, not to us. Let's try yeah, one more time. Let's try one more time. I, I think, I'm not sure, but yeah. Okay. Okay, so now we have the different microphone. Let's try this again. Let me know through the chat if you can hear. send signals to our brain to say, hey, I am getting pushed around here. Let's experience this as sound. This string is pretty special because it likes to vibrate in a certain way and at a certain speed. When you're pushing your little sister on a swing, you have to get your timing right. It takes her a certain amount of time to complete a swing and it's the same every time, basically. If you time your pushes to be the same length of time, then even gentle pushes make her swing higher and higher. That's amplification. If you try to push more frequently, you'll just end up pushing her when she's swinging backwards, and instead of going higher, you'll dampen the vibration. It's the same thing with this string. It wants to swing at a certain speed, frequency. If I were to sing that same pitch, the sound waves I'm seeing will push against the string at the right speed to amplify the vibrations so that that string vibrates while the other strings don't. It's called a sympathy vibration. Here's how our ears work. Firstly, we've got this eardrum that gets pushed around by the sound waves. And then that pushes against some ear bones that push against a cochlea, which has fluid in it. And now it's sending waves of fluid instead of waves of air. But what follows is the same concept as the swing thing. The fluid goes down this long tunnel, which has a membrane called the basilar membrane. Now, when we have a viola string, the tighter and stiffer it is, the higher the pitch, which means a faster frequency. The basilar membrane is stiffer at the beginning of the tunnel and gradually gets looser so that it vibrates at high frequencies at the beginning of the cochlea and goes through the whole spectrum down to low notes at the other end. So when this fluid starts getting pushed around at a certain frequency, such as middle C, there's a certain part of the ear that vibrates in sympathy. The part that's vibrating a lot is going to push against another kind of fluid in the other half of the cochlea, and this fluid has hairs in it which get pushed around by the fluid, and then they're like, hey, I'm middle C, and I'm getting pushed around quite a bit. Also, in humans, at least, it's not a straight tube. The cochlea is awesomely spiraled up. Okay, that's cool, but here's some questions. You can make the note C on any instrument, and the ear will be like, hey, a C. But that C sounds very different depending on whether I sing it or play it on viola. Why? And then there's some technicalities in the mathematics of swing pushing. It's not exactly true that pushing with the same frequency that the swing is swinging is the only way to get the swing to swing. You could push on just every other swing, and though the swing wouldn't go quite as high as if you pushed every time, it would still swing pretty well. In fact, instead of pushing every time or half the time, you could push once every three swings or four and so on. There's a whole series of timings that work, though the height of the swing, the amplitude, gets smaller. So in the cochlea, when one frequency goes in, shouldn't it be that part of it vibrates a lot, but there's another part that likes to vibrate twice as fast, and the waves push it every other time and make it vibrate too, and then there's another part that likes to vibrate three times as fast and four times, and this whole series is all sending signals to the brain that we somehow perceive it as a single note. Would that make sense? Let's also say we played the frequency that's twice as fast as this one at the same time. It would vibrate places that the first note already vibrated, though maybe more strongly. This overlap, you'd think, would make our brains perceive these two different frequencies as being almost the same, even though they're very far away. Keep that in mind while we go back to Pythagoras. You probably know him from the whole Pythagorean theorem thing, but he's also famous for doing this. He took a string that played some note, let's call it C, then, since Pythagoras liked simple proportions, he wanted to see what note the string would play if you made it half the length. 
So he played half the length and found that the note was an octave higher. He thought that was pretty neat. So then he tried the next simplest ratio and played a third of the string. If the full length was C, then a third the length would give the note G, an octave and a fifth above. The next ratio to try was one fourth of the string, but we can already figure out what note that would be. If half the string was C an octave up, then half of that would be C another octave up, and half of that would be another octave higher, and so on and so forth. And then one fifth of the string made the note E. But wait, let's try that again. It's a C major chord. Okay, so what about one sixth? We can figure that one out too using ratios we already know. One sixth is the same as a half of a third, and one third was this G. So one sixth is the G an octave up. Check it out. One seventh will be a new note because seven is prime, and Pythagoras found that it was this B flat. Then eight is two times two times two. So an eighth gives us C three octaves up. And a nine is a third of a third. So we go an octave and a fifth above this octave and a fifth. And the notes get closer and closer until we have all the notes on the chromatic scale. And then they go into semitones, etc. But let's make one thing clear. This is not some magic relationship between mathematical ratios and consonant intervals. It's that these notes sound good to our ears because our ears hear them together in every vibration that reaches the cochlea. Every single note has the major chord secretly contained within it. So that's why certain intervals sound consonant and others dissonant, and why tonalities like it is and why cultures that develop music independently of each other still created similar scales, chords, and tonality. This is called the overtone series, by the way. And, because of physics, but I don't really know why, a string half the length vibrates twice as fast, which, hey, makes this series the same as that series. If this were a 440, meaning that this is a swing that likes to swing 440 times a second, here's A an octave up, twice the frequency, 880. And here's E at three times the original frequency, 1320. The thing about this series, what with making the string vibrate with different lengths at different frequencies, is that the string is actually vibrating in all of these different ways even when you don't hold it down and producing all of these frequencies. You don't notice the higher ones usually because the lowest pitch is loudest and subsumes them. But say I were to put my finger right in the middle of the string so that it can't vibrate there, but didn't actually hold the string down there, then the string would be free to vibrate in any way that doesn't move at that point while these other frequencies couldn't vibrate. And if I were to touch it at the one third point, you'd expect all the overtones not to visible by three to get dampened. So we hear this and all of its overtones. The cool part is that the string is pushing around the air at all these different frequencies. And so the air is pushing around your ear at all these different frequencies. And then the basilar membrane is vibrating in sympathy with all of these frequencies. And your ear puts it together and understands it as one sound. It says, hey, we've got some big vibrations here and pretty strong ones here and some here and there and there. And that pattern is what a viola makes. It's the difference in the loudness of the overtones that gives the same note a different timbre. A simple sine wave with a single frequency with no overtones makes an ooh sound like a flute, while reedy nasal sounding instruments have more power in the higher overtones. When we make different vowel sounds, we're using our mouth to shape the overtones coming from our vocal cords, dampening some while amplifying others. To demonstrate, I recorded myself saying, at A440. Now I'm going to put it through a low pass filter which lets through the frequencies less than A441 but dampens all the overtones. Check it out. Okay, let's make ourselves an overtone series. I'm going to have Audacity create a sine wave, A220. Now I'll make another at twice the frequency, 440, which is A an octave above. Here it is alone. If we play the two at once, do you think we'll hear the two separate pitches, or will our brain say, hey, two pure frequencies an octave apart? The higher one must be an overtone of the lower one, so we're really hearing one note. Here it is. Let's have the next overtone. 3 times 220 gives us 660. Here they are all at once. It sounds like a different instrument from the fundamental sine wave, but the same pitch. Let's add 880. Now, 1000. All right, 880 plus 220 is 1100. There, let's go. We can keep going, and now we have all these happy overtones. Zooming in to see the individual sine waves, I can highlight one little bump here and see how the first overtone perfectly fits two bumps, and the next has three, then four, and so on. 
By the way, knowing that the speed of sound is about 340 meters per second, and seeing that this wave takes about 0 0.0009 seconds to play, I can multiply those out to find that the distance between here and here is about 0.3 meters, or one foot. So now all these waves are shown at actual length. So C sharp 1100 is about a foot long, and each octave down is half the frequency, or twice the length. That means the lowest C on a piano, which is five octaves lower than this C, has a sound wave one foot times two to the fifth, or 32 feet long. Okay, now I can play with the timbre of the sound by changing how loud the overtones are relative to each other. What your ears are doing right now is pretty complicated. All these sound waves get added up together into a single wave, and if I export this file, we can see what it looks like, or I suppose you could graph it. Anyway, your speakers or headphones have this little diaphragm in them that pushes the air to make sound waves. To make this shape, it pushes forward fast here, then does this wiggly thing, and then another big push forward. The speaker, remember, is not pushing air from itself to your ears. It bumps against the air, which bumps against more air, and so on, until some air bumps into your eardrum, which moves in the same way that the diaphragm and the speaker did, and that pushes the little bones that push the cochlea, which pushes the fluid, which, depending on the stiffness of the vasolar membrane at each point, is either going to push the vasolar membrane in such a way that makes it vibrate a lot and push the little hairs, or it pushes with the wrong timing, just like someone bad at playgrounds. This sound wave will push in a way that makes the A220 part of your ear send off a signal, which is pretty easy to see. Some frequencies get pushed the wrong direction sometimes, but the pushes in the right direction more than make up for it. So now all these different frequencies that we added together and played are now separated out, and in the meantime, many other signals are being sent out from other noise, like the sound of my voice and the sound of rain and traffic and noisy neighbors and the air conditioner and so on. But then our brain is like, yo, look at these, I found a pattern. All these frequencies fit together into a series turning at this pitch, so I don't think of them as one thing. And it is a different thing than these frequencies, which fit the patterns of Vi's voice. And oh boy, that's a car horn. Somehow this all works. And we're still pretty far from developing technology that can listen to lots of sound and separate it out into things anywhere near as well as our ears and brains can. Our brains are so good at finding these patterns that sometimes it finds them when they're not there, especially if it's subconsciously looking out for it when you're in a noisy situation. In fact, if the pattern is mostly there, your brain will fill in the blanks and make you hear a tone that does not exist. Here I've got A220 and its overtones. Now I'm going to mute A220. That frequency is not playing at all. But you hear the pitches A220 below this A440, even though A440 is the lowest frequency playing. Your brain is like, well, we've got all these overtones, so close enough. Let me make the highest overtones one by one. It changes the timbre, but not the pitch, until we leave only one left. Somehow, by removing a higher note, you make the apparent pitch jump up. And, just for good measure, but you should try it yourself. So there you have it. These notes. These notes given to us by simple ratios of strings, by the laws of physics and how frequencies vibrate and seem to be each other, by the mathematics of how sine waves add up. These notes are hidden in every spoken word, tucked away in every song. You hear them on bird song, bees buzzing, car horns, crickets, cries of infants, and most of the time you don't even realize they're there. There is a symphony contained in the screeching of a halting train if only you are open to listen to it. Your ears, perfect, capture these frequencies in such exquisite detail that it's a wonder that we can make sense of it all. But we do, picking out the patterns that mathematics dictates, finding order, finding beauty. So, um, I know that's that's some intense video, right? You couldn't you couldn't play that at that twice the speed or something. <laughs> but I always play this in this lecture because it's basically the quickest way to give you an introduction to sound. And uh, you know, sound is just that it's it's bouncing uh, airwaves, um, and it's a little different from um, from vision because we just discussed uh, bouncing off, uh, you know. Uh, sun rays and, and basically bouncing off light. Um, and that is interesting because the light is bouncing off an object and we look at the energy difference. While when we look at sound, it's the actual sound. It's the actual not bouncing off, which is called reverb and echo, but it's the actual wave that we are, we are seeing. Um, yeah, so any questions about that? I know, 
some pretty intense. Um, so you see my presentation all right? Can you confirm you guys see my presentation? Yep. yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, you can watch this video anytime again, obviously, but it's basically the most uh, comprehensive and yet understandable introduction to what sound is um, that I can think of. And everything actually in sound processing follows from that idea that sound is combined sine waves, okay? And so you can totally go with that. So um, here's your um, American uh, Heritage Dictionary definition. What is sound? The traveling wave, which is an oscillation of pressure transmitted through a solid, liquid, or gas composed of frequencies within the range of hearing and of a level sufficiently strong to be heard or the sensation stimulated in organs of hearing by such vibrations. So sound cannot have arbitrary frequencies. The frequencies need to be in a certain range. That's usually assigned anywhere between 16 Hertz and 22 kilohertz, okay? A Hertz is one oscillation per second. And you should also remember that as sound travels through air, it has this specific uh, sound, speed of sound. But as it goes to solid, liquid, or gas, which is not air, maybe, uh, things will change. And then also in the transition, there's usually some loss. So uh, things will sound differently. Um, and um, also the speed of change, the speed uh, changes. So um, that is basically just your basic definition. and. Now we already saw from Byheart the, the the typical visualization of sound that everybody knows sort of from the wave player or when you ever edit some piece of audio looks like this, where basically you go from left to right in time, that's your x-axis. And on the y-axis, you go from zero to one or zero to minus one, which is basically your oscillation going through the uh, you know zero point. Um, and by the way, it's called zero crossing when you go through the zero point. And the oscillation itself is obviously the height of the oscillation is called amplitude. And so this is called a uh, regular, you know, amplitude visualization. It's called time domain or amplitude space or waveform. It's, it's the typical thing. You must have seen that, right? It's just your standard stuff. And then, um, Where's my cursor? Here we go. Um, there's other visualizations. For example, instead of time on the x-axis, you could have um, frequency on the x-axis, right? So as you see that the, the sound is composed of different uh, frequencies of sine waves, we can decompose the sound into sine waves. Uh, this works with the Fourier transformation um, because sine waves have interesting mathematical properties that can be exploited such that they can be separated into frequencies, uh, into the individual powers of their frequencies. And um, these are called orthogonal functions uh, and generalized into what's called wavelets. But for now, we keep it at sine, sine waves. And yeah, so this would be uh, a sound in frequency space. What you have here on the x-axis is the frequency going from 0 to 8,000 in this case. and then. The, on the y-axis is the energy of that frequency, and that's usually measured in decibel, okay? So that's basically the power or energy. I mean, power is, uh, energy is power times time. So the, the trick here is that it's actually equivalent because we know the time. The time is, you know, one thousandth of a second, right? So you can call those powers, but in reality is energy is because we know it's, it's measured at one thousandth of a second or one two thousand of a second or whatever, wherever you are in that particular one. Um, so that's called the frequency domain or the Fourier space or the spectrum, okay? Spectrum of the sound. Now, with there's more, right? So often in speech, you go and say, okay, so there's other ways of looking at things. For example, uh, this is a 3D plot. Um, this is basically time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and then energy visualized as dark versus light color. Um, and that helps us actually look, um, it's called a spectrogram. 
And the spectrogram is there to, I think it's described here. Yes, it's called a spectrogram. And the spectrogram is there to analyze sound patterns in a better way. Um, basically, each line going sort of um, vertically up would be um, a spectrum, right? Each of them is a spectrum. Um, but the trick is that um, the trick is that um, with this visualization, if you do this with speech, you could even see the words. I mean, there are people that have been trained in linguistics to just see those words uttered based on the spectrogram. Okay, so you see that a lot in speech, and it's important to know what's on the axes there. Um, and then, um, as I said earlier, um, you can draw these for anything. You could draw these for gamma rays or something, right? But it's more interesting to think about why do we draw these? Well, uh, the range of sounds is is in a spectrum. Okay, so we have um, we don't hear everything, um, and in fact, we don't hear proportionally either. Um, so I know that some people, you know, worked on uh, some people in my group, for example, work on um, uh, models for visual perception, where it's like, okay, so how do colors actually differ because they're not linear? Um, so the same thing happens in sound, and it's very well understood though. So in sound, what you have is is the science of sound is really interesting because uh, it, you know there was a lot of measurements and they just figured that out. So if you look at the frequency space here, typically our hearing goes from 10 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. Um, it really, really just starts as kind of 16 Hertz and then goes to 20 kilohertz. And as you age, you go down to like 18 kilohertz, 16 kilohertz, whatever. And, and then if you go up uh, decibel, uh, with decibel SPL, which I'm gonna explain a bit, basically the, the power of the sound goes up. Um, you at some point reach a pain threshold where it's too too loud. You cannot hear this. This is too much vibration. But more interestingly, in the lower part, it's if the frequency is low, you need more power to actually perceive the sound. And we have an optimal, which is about four kilohertz, where we need the least power to perceive the sound. And guess what? That is the range of speech, right? So basically, typically around four kilohertz of speech. And that has to do with the fact that when we talk, we really want to understand each other. So our brain is being tuned to really, you know, sort of get that frequency range really well, while other ranges, music and other noises are kind of optional. And so, um, so especially when it goes below one kilohertz, you need a lot more power to hear that. And if it goes above sort of eight kilohertz ish, 10 kilohertz ish, need a lot, lot, lot more power to hear that, especially in a very high frequency spectrum. Um, um, yeah, the vocal range is larger uh, than just four kilohertz. You can see it here. The orchestral range obviously is even larger. Um, the auditory experience is, uh, you know, within the orchestral range in terms of frequencies, but obviously you can hear stuff that is very, very loud, and the orchestra wouldn't like to expose you to that. Um, but a vocal range is actually surprisingly large, um, despite the fact that most speech happens at around 4 kilohertz. Okay. Yeah, um, now we already have this introduced as DBSPL, and DBSPL stands for decibel sound pressure level. Okay. And now let's take a close look at what this does. Okay. So 10 log 10 of the root mean square of the sound pressure being measured uh, divided by a reference, okay? And if you take a closer look at this measurement, does that remind you of something? Any, anybody? So what I see here is first of all, um, if you put in negative sign on it, we could go, uh, um, sorry, we don't have to put a negative sign on it. What I'm saying is what I'm seeing here is a logarithm, right? First and foremost. And yes, you can actually convert dbSPL into bits again. 
okay? So DBSPL is nothing else but an analog sound uh, complexity measurement. It's basically looking at the variance of the sound. And the interesting part here is, yes, you can totally convert that into bits. And we'll actually do that when we do AD conversion. And the interesting part is that, yeah, this was developed by the same people that actually had Shannon developed a bit, but uh, so at t Bell Labs, and that's where it comes from, Bell, right? Um, but the interesting part is that it's nothing else but a very compatible measurement uh, to our regular bit measurement, but it uses log 10, okay? Um, and so here's how you actually do the conversion. Eight bits would be 48 dB SPL, 11 bits would be 66, and 16 bits, which is actually the most important because that's what a CD-ROM does, and that's what MP3 and all these uh, 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 compression formats now do because the CD-ROM did that, is 96 dB SPL. And then if you go studio quality, it's 24 bits. That will be 144 dB SPL. And now that we have this idea, that sort of, you know, sound, for example, in 16 bits means 96 dB SPL range, we should go back to our hearing thing and say, aha, so our hearing range goes from minus 20 to, you know, 140 something. So it turns out, yes, uh, you can totally catch the orchestra range if you make the reference like 20 with a CD, because that range would be 80 dB SPL. But if you want to catch the entire range, it's, it's about 140. And so that's why there is 24 bits uh, sound formats and the 16 bit sound formats are mostly for music. Okay, so just for your information, um, having said that, I only know that studio quality using 24 bits. Usually if you encode a video with some good sound, it's 16 bits, okay. But yeah, that's, uh, that's where this comes from, it's completely uh, compatible and, and convertible, and that allows you to actually do, uh, you know, these these kind of uh, measurements uh, back and forth. Um, now, we already know that uh, loudness depends on frequency, right? So, if you have 40 dB SPL in a let's say uh, 50 hertz, then we don't hear anything. But if you have 40 dB SPL in in a four kilohertz, then it's actually quite loud, right? And so now there are curves that will actually normalize that. And it's called A weighting and there's different weighting schemes, but A weighting is like the most uh, common and it's called A law sometimes too. What it does is just it takes the frequency and normalizes in such a way that the, the decibel gains just say the same independent of the frequency. So perceptually you hear the same uh, loudness for the same decibel measure independent of the frequency, okay? And that's important because what you want is if you, if you have a knob on your stereo and it says a decibel measure, it's very difficult to have this model here in mind, right? What you really want is just like saying, okay, for me, this number means something. And so that's why all the stereos and all the speakers will have like an A-weighted scheme, right? It's to get rid of this thing. Now, why is this important for you? Well, this is important for you when you buy a stereo, but it's also important for you when you use machine learning. If you if you train on on like non-weighted data and and test on weighted data, you're gonna be in a big surprise. Okay, so you gotta make sure while this all sounds the same to you, that we gotta make sure what the sound format actually is that you put in there, because sometimes you can be completely off, right? And uh, now on that note, how is sound actually recorded? Again, last time we talked about how actually a pixel is recorded and sound is literally recorded very easily. So this was a, a the first um, sound recorder. Um, does anybody know who, who invented that? Any guess? Thomas Alva Edison, the same guy who invented the light bulb, also invented this particular sound recording device. And the way it works is that a microphone just picks up that vibration on the air and it puts it into a um, sort of, there's a stencil and the stencil 
um, records the vibrations onto, I think, a candle pretty much, right? So wax. And then when you want to play it back, um, all you do is instead of a sharp stencil, you do something that is not so sharp and then read and then the vibration goes the other way. Um, so that would be here what we call a microphone in, you know, a first version of a microphone. Uh, that will be a medium like a CD and, and these days or actually just a hard disk. But back then, of course, we were thinking of Vina records and so on. And then you have the time control, right? If you, if you go faster, then you have less uh, um, less resolution. If you go slower, you have more resolution, but more resolution requires more medium, right? Um, and guess what? A modern microphone doesn't work so differently, okay? A modern microphone, instead of doing, taking the, the sound directly as a wave and putting it on a stencil, what we do is we take the sound directly and convert it into the vibrations of a ferret core that then will actually uh, induce electricity into, into wires. And then you can measure sort of the electricity coming out of those wires. And that is directly proportional to the sound that you were recording. Um, and uh, while you don't have to know all of this, it's important that different microphones obviously create different artifacts on how they record the sound. And so if you train with one set of microphones and then you test on another set of microphones, mission learning can fail. Um, but that's very similar to lens and camera aberrations that you have in video, except in sound, they actually kind of, they, they hurt more. Okay, I'm just saying. Um, and what you usually want to really do, especially in machine learning, that's kind of best practice, is to distinguish between near field and far field. Okay. So near field is something that's close to the sound source, like you know, a lapel microphone, like your headset, right? Um, or a boom microphone. In fact, in movies and TVs, while we don't see anybody wearing hair, a microphone, what they do is they put the microphone just over their head, so it's a little bit so that they're out of the camera, but close enough that they can do good, good sound. And so it's a boom microphone. And also singers, singers will use something like, you know, a microphone like this, where you really have to go close and, and sing. And um, um, that means uh, that sort of TV productions, movies, uh, typical, uh, you know, headset based talks, uh, singers, they will all be near field. Now far field means further away from the sound source. For example, a lapel microphone, a stationary microphone, webcams, handheld cams, me right now, because I switched from the EO plugs to uh, to um, my standard microphone, um, I would be further away from the sound. And that means we also record the room in there, right? So you hear a lot more room right now than you heard with, with my, with the earpods. Um, and um, that makes a difference, especially to a machine learner. Okay. Now, again, the difference is that near field has more energy, less distortion, captures sound source well. And the far field captures the environment with sound source is better for forensic, right? So for example, um, the, the, if you ever want to sort of guess based on sound, what is the, um, uh, if you want to guess based on sound, what is the, uh, how do you do that? Uh, what is the location of where something was recorded? Is it a room? Is it a church? Then obviously near field will not help you but far field will. Um, but if you actually do not care about church or studio or whatever, you really want to get rid of the room, then obviously you should get near field, okay? Um, yeah, so the di directionality. Question. Yes. Okay, I, ha I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so you said that um, the near field and far fields capture, I guess, slightly different signals. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you're recording, you know, in the same environment. Mm -hmm. So um, isn't it, is it possible for someone to identify the kind of transformation that will take like uh, from signals connect, co collected from a near field microphone to one that's far field uh, microphone so that, you know, you can kind of um, go from between instead of 
uh, having to recollect the signals from a different device. Um, yes. So um, in practice, what they do is they use a bunch of Farfetch microphones. So like if you think about your iPhone, it actually has a bunch of microphones here in the, in the, on the bottom. Um, and so that makes it so that you can actually talk remotely, um, even like in traffic. Um, usually, it's not so easy to find the transformation because it depends on so much stuff, okay? It depends on your room, your position in the room. It depends on like maybe the temperature really uh, right now because the microphone will react differently and so on and so forth. So that transformation between near field and far field is not easy to filter out, okay? And there's actually a demo on it. I wonder if it still works. Um, um, yeah, so we can, uh, let, me, let me show you the demo. Um, um, if I share the demo, share screen. Yeah, so this is the this is the link that is on the slides, and this is the far field versus near field. So near field, listen to the audio. So really, what I want to have is a place that if a researcher wants that information, they can add it. Right. So should I play that again? Maybe one more time. So really, what I want to have is a place that if a researcher wants that information, they can add it. Right. And so that's near field. Now listen to far field. So really what I want to have is a place that if a researcher wants that information, they can add it. Yeah, do that again. So really what I want to have is a place that if a researcher wants that information, they can add it. And while for our ears, there is not so much difference, you can easily see in the waveform, but also in the spectrogram, that there's huge difference. Um, um, it's not small. So it's not like a formula to go from A to B. I mean, maybe you could do something learned, right? You could try some autoencoder or something to try that, but it's not easy. And it's very flexible too, because different room, different um, different acoustics, you know, even different location of the head and stuff will do a bunch of stuff. So uh, it, again, maybe an autoencoder could do something, but just saying, it, yeah. Um, I just by a first uh, glance at the spectrogram is it looks like the far field um, microphone is collecting like, um, it's like the near field audio, but injected with, you know, some kind of noise. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, there's a way to find a pattern in those kind of noise being injected. And the reason I ask this is because like we as humans can usually tell if something is Collect, uh, collected uh, from a near field or far field uh, microphone. Because I think the far field um, microphone usually pick up signals that's, um, that's noisy, but you know, you wouldn't probably hear those in the near field microphone because you know, they're collecting slightly different things. But I feel like the far field ones is in the near field one injected with some noise that's related to the physical uh, dimension of the room that it's being recorded in. But I don't know. I'm just wondering if there has been uh, works done on this particular yeah, aspect. So there, has, there has been almost too much work done on this aspect, right? So there were so many people trying to come up with individual formulas to, to get rid of the room. Um, it's, it's almost ridiculous. Um, what happens is, it, it's not just so what I mean, if you listen to this again, just to, to hear it again. So, really, what I want to have is a place that if a researcher wants that information, they can have it. Yeah, so, so that is showing you that, that it's not just noise, there's also reverb. So, what happens is the, in, a, in a near field microphone, you have the signal once, right? The signal goes in, done. In a far field, the signal goes in and then it bounces off the wall and comes in again with a little delay, right? And this is really a phenomenon we don't have so much in vision because vision, we have light speed, right? It's really difficult to sort of see little differences like this with light speed. 
but because we don't have light speed, we have speed of sound. And speed of sound is significantly slower. I mean, you know, large, large, large number of orders of magnitude slower than light speed. You can actually, and there's also frequency dependency of the reverberation and so on. You can actually have really complicated effects. It's also not clear that a signal just bounces off the wall once. It may have to bounce off the wall twice or three times and then come up much much later in, again. And so that makes it just super hard to, um, the dynamics of that are just super hard. Right? I see. Thanks, Professor. So let's go and share again. We may actually reach the end, but let's see how far we get right now. Uh -huh. But yeah, that's very good. Thanks for asking this question. I think there's a lot of people who think you could just, you know, and I, I mean, there are, that's why there's so many publications on it, uh, that you think you can just find some function and, and repair it. Um, the function would be dependent on your room, basically. It's, it's a room dependent function and the location dependent function and the frequency dependent function. It just depends on the humidity factor. Um, also, it depends on this, which is like, um, called microphone directionality. Microphone directionality is that you could have um, um, minus five dB and so on. Different different directions give you different uh, sensitivity of the microphone. And so the most important one is the ball. You see that would be in the center of the room. But then there's also what's called a cardioid and double cardioid. And this is where this is um, uh, on the bottom right is a directional microphone, which is just basically trying to get one person or one object. Um, and it doesn't matter because let's say you walk around the microphone. Now, in the first upper left microphone case, nothing changes. It's just you know the same thing. But let's say in the upper uh, lower right microphone case, you hear nothing except for when you're exactly in front of the microphone. And now this is another set of artifacts. Um, you don't have to think about so much when it's near field, but you have to think about it when it's far field. Um, yeah, and I think we'll stop here as this we now go into from the physics into when we digitize the sound. And once we digitize the sound, uh, then we'll actually stay in the digital space um, and talk about features that we can use for machine learning or not use for machine learning and how things changed from the olden past where we all used features and to now with deep learning, where by the way, there's no sound system that I know that where the sound goes directly into the deep learner. Usually the, the state of the art wisdom is you have some basic feature extraction and often it's just doing a Fourier transform and then put that into the deep learner. Okay, so there is already something with sound that doesn't make it just as easy as just pixels where you put them, but also you have to be frank, nobody puts the pixels in directly either. You usually at least scale them down or create mini images and so on, right? So Stuff like this exists for audio as well. We're going to talk about it. Um, and it just, you know, it's good to have a solid, in my mind, it's good to have a solid, at least quick physical introduction of how we record sound and, you know, what sound actually is, because it's, uh, it seems to be, you know, actually in some ways under taught. So I'm hoping I could fix that deficit. Yeah, any questions? Um, so what I will do is I'll stop share, and then I also stop the recording so then questions can be more. Um, stop recording.